The New Triumvirate by Conway Fitzgerald Prologue 141 years ago He was gone. There was nothing more they could do. Nuna, while still known as their high priestess, and not the great druid, had exhausted her powers. Gareth and the other members of his woodland clergy attempted to find a way to bring Dan back to life, but they could not. Theb had warned me of this, not to fall prey to my own emotions and make the mistake of following Dan and his order. They will all be dead very soon. He warned me so often, and now, not only was he proven right, Theb was also dead, a victim of my foolish devotion to that order and my love for Dan Tenuvio. Though the Wood Elves had gained great respect for the humans of the order, one of their own kind, the Wood Elven wizard Seshona, had also given her long life to their cause of defending Castle Voss and the ways of the Order of the Sacred Fire. She believed in our cause wholeheartedly. The Wood Elves of Telsuma had also become quite fond of the great seer, Fergus of Ibach, while he recuperated with them in Telsuma, something no human had ever done. So out of respect and perhaps pity, the Wood Elves and Druids of Telsuma did their best to make Dan as presentable in death as possible. They also healed my shattered stomach from the powerful punch I had suffered. I was mostly better, though eating and exertion were still quite painful. This was a wound I would feel for many years to come. The druids fashioned a beautiful wood casket for Dan to travel in. His body was laid on a stag-drawn cart, which they agreed I could ride back to Voss and deliver Dan's body home for final burial. It would be my solemn duty to return him home, to be buried at Voss in the Mausoleum of Heroes, a legendary member of the White Flame. He looks amazing. Almost as if he's simply sleeping, I said with a smile, before my eyes once again welled with tears. They had dressed and wrapped him. His beautiful face remained exposed so all could bear witness to his death and his final resting place among the greatest heroes in the world. Return to us, asked Gareth. We understand. You must live among the humans, but we will always have a place for you here. The old Wood Elf smiled. Gareth was one of the few survivors of the Zalti massacre. He knew and served my father, the great druid Pule. Gareth believed in all the prophecies and expected for me to return in triumph to Telsuma and assume the mantle of the great druid. That was a position that had remained unfilled since my father's death. No one had yet dared to claim the scimitar of sharpness, not even Nuna. So that sacred blade remained within a secret vault, hidden in the wooden tunnels of the Great Druid's Hall. Thank you, Gareth. You've always been such a good friend to me. I'm sure my father would be very pleased with you, I told him. And with you as well, Ermine. Very pleased. Gareth smiled at me proudly. I nodded with a smile of my own. Tell Nuna. Thanks. I must return to Voss. After that, well, we will see what is next. I declared. I then started along the road out of Telsuma, towards the Ostrom, into the human farming fields that were once home to my human mother, Gale. As I rode through those harvested fields in the brisk autumn air, I pondered her young life, 
A simple existence of serfdom, without any expectation for elevation. She was promised only a chance of a short human life of servitude, working every day, raising farm animals for the Earl. She never expected to become ensnared in the tragedy that was my creation. Yet today, in the quiet peace of that chilly Ostrom meadow, I felt a new connection to that place. It was a benevolence and familiarity I had never felt before. The mostly human farming population were inconsequential. Mostly the same, regardless of the century in which they lived and died. But something else was present and calling me. I've always, since my childhood, been aware of the watchful eyes of the druid's many informants. From time to time, those birds would gossip. Every creature of the ancient forest would talk, and they all wanted to listen, whether big or small. I knew this. Feb warned me of their presence many times. They were keeping tabs on my movements at the behest of my father's followers. But now that I truly knew them personally, I felt more connected to them, almost like I could truly hear and finally understand what they were all clamoring on about. Suddenly, my dreamlike state was broken. I heard the sound of tiny wings fluttering before me. It was a pixie fairy. She was waving her little hands at me. Huh. Well, hello there, I said, quite surprised. The tiny pixie did not speak. Instead, she moved her hands and face in such ways that she spoke to me without words. Airmine. You are Airmine, the pixie signed. Yes, that is what the druids call me. I prefer Tia, I responded as the pixie started signing again. Why don't you want to be called Airmine? Are you not the one they said would become the Restorer? What? No. I extended the palm of my hand out to her. She trusted my gesture and landed on my hand. I then snatched her deftly. As she struggled to escape my grasp, I brought her little face directly opposite to mine. If you won't speak, then listen. I am not the Restorer. Understand? I said forcefully. I then released her. She fluttered several feet back in disappointment, but she did not go away. What do you want, little pixie? Faye Hairslet, she signed back, and I understood. What do you want, Faye Hairslet? The cloak, your protector. He is gone? She asked innocently, signing a perfect caricature of Theb's gloomy persona and his hooded gray face. Yes, I said sadly. Why, what is that to you? I am the one that was appointed to be his contact with the Whispering Wood, she signed back. A mute spokesperson. That makes perfect sense, I responded jokingly. I am not a mute. I simply speak differently, she argued defiantly. Fine, fine. What does any of that have to do with me? I started to get restless with this intrusion. Well, with the cloak gone, that means I am now your spokesperson. I am here to bring you an urgent message, she signed with added emphasis. I'm sorry, little Faye. I don't know what anyone else has told you, but I have things to do. If there's an emergency in the forest, Go tell it to Nuna, I said to her dismissively. I could feel as if the entire forest was watching us and listening in to our strange conversation. But Nuna is not the promised one. That is you, she insisted. Like I said, I do not use the name Airmine anymore. I have no interest 
and whatever it is you've come to tell me. I spurred the stags to continue pulling the wagon. But you do care. It was all your doing, she insisted. What was my doing? What are you talking, signing about? The Fay then flew back in front of me with her desperate pleas for help. Leon of Harda has resumed construction of his road. They are cutting the path through the Iron Debt. That same road you and Dan Tenuvio made him promise to stop, she signed, pointing to the human body I towed behind me. He's what? I asked. The fiery temper I had inherited from my father was suddenly reignited. That lying sack of worm dung, I grunted in displeasure. I know. They are awful humans. They have betrayed you. They are attacking our forest. He needs to be made to stop. Only you are capable of telling him. She pleaded with me again. I looked to her with compassion. I was surprised Nuna hadn't come to tell me this herself. Chances are she was likely now on her way there, putting herself in great danger. Is Nuna aware? I asked. I then looked back again to Dan's body. Faye Herslet nodded and then pointed to the east. Yes, she and Gareth are gathering their forces. They were afraid to ask you because of your mission. The Fey motioned to Dan's body. But I am afraid for them. Unlike Dan, they are not powerful fighters. They need you, she signed innocently. I cannot. Not now. Tell them to wait until I return from Voss. Tell them I will return soon, and I will help them. But I need to bring Dan home first, I promised. The Fae nodded with a smile, and then flew off into the woods as quickly as she came. For the next few hours, I rode my stags to a quick trot on the main road north, making much better time. Though they were grunting and breathing heavily, as my impatience was tiring them. When I neared the outskirts of the village of Bol, I allowed them some much needed rest. There was increasing traffic on the highway, so I had the cart parked closer to the forest under a canopy of trees. I then used invisibility magic on the entire carriage to prevent it from drawing any unwanted attention. While the stags rested, I approached the road to people watch under the veil of invisibility. Suddenly, an avian messenger fluttered above me. It was a tiny sparrow. It was chirping profusely. Its sharp birdsong then made sense to me as words. I understood. It had a message to give me. It said, There is a woman riding from Voss that you know. The human ranger, Keely Breen. She is attempting to flee a large cavalry of fighting men. It was then I saw Keely Breen riding south in earnest. She looked distressed. I used flight magic to pursue her down the road. Keely, where are you going? I called out to her. She looked all around her, spooked by my voice, which seemed to be carried by the wind. Keely, it is I, Tia. Where are you going? Tia. She asked, stopping her frothing horse. Am I dreaming, or did I hear Tia speak? She said, looking around her, trying to locate me. I then revealed myself to her. Tia, it is you. It is a miracle, she said loudly. A miracle? <laughs> Not exactly, I said modestly. Where are you heading? Tia... Lord Ushvin has been sacked. Castle Voss has been usurped. The initiates of the Order have all been arrested. Arrested? What? Why? They call themselves the Coalition of the Northern States. They have come from all over the surrounding earldoms. Teton, 
Bishop, and Ebok, and the Lands West. They've claimed Castle Voss as their new capital to fight back the coming northern invaders. They fear becoming vassals to King Ivan of the Tondalans. With so many questions bombarding my head all at once, I couldn't speak. Keeley continued her tale. When these robber knights learned Dan left the castle, they gathered their armies and came to Voss. They told us it was to support Dan's leadership under the flag of the Lizard King. They took advantage of his absence. Your absence. We need for the White Flame to return, to reclaim the Castle Voss in the name of the Order. Are you with Dan now? She asked innocently. Yes, I answered. Her face filled with joyous relief, and she finally allowed herself to exhale. Thank the Allfather. When their cavalry first arrived, they claimed to be our allies. Then, once inside, they started making demands. Then they removed Ushvin as governor and installed their own man, a true charlatan from the south. I stepped away from her in anguish as she spoke. She followed me on her horse. Where is Dan? she asked. I then led her to the place off the highway by the woods, where I had hidden the carriage and his body. When I was sure the coast was clear, I removed the invisibility spell I had cast on the carriage and the stags that were driving it. There, resting in the carriage, was the beatific face of the greatest of giant killers. Is that him? she asked. Yes. I exhaled. Is he dead? She looked upon his still body with great sadness. She looked to me, and I nodded. She started to weep. Yes. He was killed at Zaitifetan. I intended to return him to Voss today, so that he could be properly buried there with the rest of the White Flame. Now, I grunted with exasperation. You're saying... These robber knights have arrested Ushvin and Thurdric? Yes. They've outlawed the Order. They've scattered many of the initiates away at threat of prosecution. I would have fought to free Ushvin, but there were just too many, she lamented. I rode for Torbana to find allies. You did the right thing, Keeley. Clearly, our connection here today is no accident. Just then, a thunderous galloping of horses could be heard, emerging from the road north. It's the governor's cavalry. They must have followed me. I don't know how. I told no one where I was heading, she warned. I demanded her silence, and then cast a magic illusion spell to hide our position within a thick hedgerow of thorny shrubs. I motioned for her to stay low. There were at least 200 armored horsemen in the cavalry. They rode in perfect unison. The pounding hooves of the massive cavalry scared away every merchant and passerby off the highway and into the muddy gulches beneath. Then the momentum of the cavalry reduced. Then it ceased. They had stopped. The breadth of their line of horses filled the road in each direction as far as the eye could see. Once again, another tiny sparrow fluttered above me. It chirped to me frantically. There are human rangers coming. They are tracking Keeley Breen. The sparrow then fluttered away. Why are there rangers following you? I asked her. Rangers? No. She said confidently. Then she shuddered at the thought of betrayal. No, it couldn't be. About a dozen armored human horsemen then rode closer to the point in the highway where I had stopped Keeley. Some of the horsemen leapt from their mounts and started inspecting the trails left by her horse. They started looking back north to our position. 
We need to get out of here, I said to her forcefully. Well, what will we do with Dan? She asked. I remembered the incantation Khan had taught me, the very one he used to hide us after the ambush at Torbana. Khan showed me how to create a temporary bubble in time and space. He called it a cosmic safe house. In that bubble, there was room for all of us and all of our things. While we were there, we could not be seen in the known world. We no longer existed. We no longer required breath, food, water, or rest. Though when the magic was spent, the bubble would burst, and anyone left within lost forever. If cast by Master Silas, a safe house like this could last for over a hundred years. Performed by any lesser mage, like me perhaps. Ten. I began the incantation. The mounted rangers stopped again and then dismounted when they reached the prickly thorn brush illusion I had woven before them. These were experienced trackers. They realized quickly the path was being obscured by magic. They could not yet see us, but they started in closer towards our position in the woods. There they found Keeley's horse, just as she had left it, tied to a tree branch. Keeley and I were busy struggling to lift Dan's heavy casket up into the cosmic safe house I had enchanted above us. I used flight magic to create the portal about eight feet aloft to help ensure its non-detection. The eyes of these trackers tended mostly towards the ground. Now Keeley and I used every ounce of strength we could muster to pull Dan's casket up. My stomach was still stinging with pain. Keeley stood atop one of the large stags precariously and pushed up on the casket towards the magic portal. After I finally pulled the heavy box into the portal, I then flew down to retrieve Keeley. She was a stocky human female, equipped with chainmail armor. My healing stomach lurched with pain further as I pulled her up into the safe house. I then closed the portal. When the first of the pursuing rangers reached our position, he saw only the white tails of the two stags sprinting away into the forest. The empty carriage was broken in pieces as it dragged behind them and collided with forest obstacles. The silent ranger loaded his longbow and fired at one of the stags. He struck the stag in the hindquarters. It continued on, but soon after, both of the large male deer were hunted down and killed. Keely and I watched them from the safety of our invisible safe house. We had saved Dan's casket, as well as ourselves. Keely and I were in an altered state of being. Within that space-time bubble, we did not breathe or have need for food or water. We were aware, almost as if within a levitated fishbowl, we could observe the Regian Rangers just below us, searching the spot where the trail ran cold. She must be hiding with the forest elves, said their solemn leader. Of course, this is where the road to Hada shall be. The Breen girl must have gone to warn them, to gain their allegiance against us. The forest elves are numerous in this wood. We should probably withdraw, said his second in command. No, no forest elf or woodland being can move me from this spot. Find her. She's hiding here somewhere. She can't be far. His leader commanded. These Regian trackers were world-renowned and very persistent. But as the cold of winter descended upon them, and their frantic searches all came up empty. They finally withdrew their powerful cavalry back to Castle Voss. It was early in the morning, during the dead of winter, that I finally reopened the portal. 
I peered out into the known world and saw a fox below us, traipsing through the snow. I whistled at him. He turned his head to me and said, All of their spies have left. It is safe to leave. The young ranger Keely Breen and I then exited the portal. I closed the magic door behind us, causing the bubble to become invisible once again. Keely had leapt out feet first. She dropped to the ground and into two feet of snow. Neither of us were equipped with winter garb, so we felt the intense cold immediately. That did help us awaken after being in magic stasis for so long. Oh, I cannot ever remember being so bored. How long were we wherever it is we were, she said, pulling her cloak tightly about her body. I'd say at least a few weeks. Those trackers from Regia were awfully persistent. You must be considered a pretty high-value mark to draw that kind of pursuit. Who did you anger so? It appears Governor Mist did not like what I had to say before I left. Governor Mist? His name is Emeron Mistal. He's the newly appointed governor. They call him Mist. I petitioned for the release of Ushvin and Thurdrick. I reminded Mist we had established laws in the Castle Voss. He told me he was the law. This was his response. Tia, how will we free Ushvin, Thurdrick, and the others? How can we win back Castle Voss from these bandits? Well, we can't do it alone. And we can't do it right this moment, I said. Keely looked stunned by my lack of urgency. I've committed myself to another battle back east, towards Harder. Let us go there first. We can find allies and, together, determine a plan. But how can we ever relight the sacred fire without a high mage? High Lord and High Priest. Without a new triumvirate, we are no longer in order, Keeley said passionately as she shivered in the cold. We're all that's left. How will they be found? She asked desperately. I then reached into my bag of endless holding. I pulled out the three letters that Fergus had insisted on giving me. Fergus was world-renowned as the Great Seer. He was very wise. I have these. We have their names, I said to her. I held the three envelopes before her. These letters were addressed by Fergus to the name of each intended recipient. These are the same three names Fergus had proclaimed to be the new triumvirate before the sacred fire. Each envelope contains a message penned by the great seer himself. Fergus had tasked me with delivering these messages. That is how. We need to find these people and give them these messages, I told her. But first, we need to help my friends. 101 years ago. Forty years later, I returned to that very spot to find that, miraculously, my magic bubble had not yet burst. Dan's casket and his wrapped body within were still safely inside that cosmic space-time vacuum. I even remembered the portal password I had created. Be right back in the common language of the Western humans. I, on the other hand, was a wreck. I was alone again, wounded badly, and without many people I could call my friends. The Elvish Rebellion had been quashed, and so many long Elvish lives cut short. For a moment, 
I allowed myself to believe the druid's tales. I thought, perhaps I could restore the Iredet forest and bring the bird song back. I was wrong. The safe house remained intact as I levitated the casket out and then flew it several miles to the northeast, away from that newly constructed highway which cut through the heart of the Iredet. I found a large oak tree that seemed to preside like a king over a peaceful hidden meadow. I chose that spot beneath that oak tree to bury Dantinuvial. I then stayed in that hidden acre and hid myself. I had constructed a little home and used guile and the warnings of the whispering wood to preserve myself and remain hidden there for over a century. Present Day I first met Talma Breen in a village called Rumen in the Central Plain. She was a young scout who accompanied some female acolytes of a northern church born of Ebok. They mentioned the name of Fergus often in their sermons and prayers, which drew my attention. Later, when I met Talma, she claimed to be granddaughter to Keely Breen. Is that right? You people must be touched by the gods. I smiled at them and reached gently for Talma's hand. At that moment, and in that place, I was pretending to be a traveling spiritualist, a human soothsayer named Alumun. After I read her palm for ten pieces, Tulma went on about her grandmother's stories, how she had traveled to the edge of the known world and returned with many mixed-race prisoners, slaves of the giants they had liberated there. Then, how she had fought to protect the forest elves during the Elvish Rebellion. Her facts were more correct than not. She had information that would seem irrelevant for someone who was not truly related to Keeley. So her story was compelling to me. I spoke more with Tulma. She was very charismatic and had gained my trust. I don't remember if I drew the map the boys possessed myself in a drunken haze, or if Tulma simply held her liquor better than I and had memorized it. A few weeks later, the Whispering Wood told me Tulma Breen was heading towards my home. I welcomed and received her. We had tea in my little house. She told me she couldn't stay long, but she suggested strongly that the story of the White Flame, the true story, should be heard. I agreed, telling her my greatest wish was to set straight the history of Dan Tenuvial and the Great Seer. I wanted to tell the true story of the giant killers and of the Old Order. The truth should be known, she said. So when Marsek and Sherman arrived at my door a month ago, it seemed natural to take them in and tell them my story. They were so benign. They were smart curious human boys, so eagerly in search of the truth. How they reminded me of the human men of the White Flame, so innocent and true. After I had some time to re-examine Sherman's map, I was sure it was at least a copy of the one I had drawn for Tulma Breen. I understood her giving it to the boys of the Church of the Great Seer, but how that map ever made its way to the governor of Voss was troubling. The current governor is notorious for being an opponent of any religion celebrating the active gods. But when the two teen boys found my home deep in the Iredet, claiming to be from Voss, it caused me to drop my guard. They were expected. I asked Tulma for this. Yet as I sent the boys away, and covered the path behind them, I realized I had made a potentially fatal mistake. I had been played. 
This new Mist Governor was very clever. He knew only the innocent faces of those two acolytes could lure me out of hiding. I considered my next moves carefully. Faye Herslet completed the task of obscuring the forest trail. There would be no corroboration of the house location that the boys would certainly tell of. I had reacquired the map from them, though assumed there was another copy, or even the original I had penned myself. Within the next day or so, the overgrowth will be complete. No one will see any paths, the Fey signed. Good. Though I'll miss that place. It was home for so long, I said. The one called Tulma Breen is in Bowl. She's staying at the Black Crow Inn, under the name Macy, the Fey signed. She seems to know some of the members of the Shallow Ditch, as well as the Governor's Cavalry. She was speaking with both about you, the Fey warned. Hmm, I figured that. I'm slipping in my old age. Well, thank you, Fey Herslet. Come now, return to my bag. Where I'm heading next, it could get pretty rough. I motioned for her to return to my endless bag of holding, for safekeeping. She refused. No, I don't want to get into that bag again. It's scary in there. I can fly. I'll be fine, she insisted. Oh, my dear Fay, your old wings are not what they used to be. You're just not fast enough anymore. I tried to convince her, but she wasn't having it. She folded her tiny arms and shook her head. Oh, wow. Look how bright Elysia is tonight. I motioned to the moons that hung over the tree line. When Fay Herslet looked over to see them, I grabbed her and then bagged her before she could protest. Then I headed back into the forest to meet an old friend before continuing on to Bowl and the one who called herself Tilma Breen. Thanks so much for watching, everyone. If you haven't yet, please subscribe and ring the bell for notifications so you never miss an episode. Be sure to smash that like button and comment below. It helps a lot. If you'd like to help me get this book published, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. And as always, be sure to share this story with all of your friends on your favorite social media.